Good day. I will I'll now call uh, this meeting of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment to order. Uh, my name is Ron Bonatrus and the MLA for the Detro Riding and Deputy Chair of this committee. Uh, I will assume chair this morning as uh, the chair, Mr. Jackie Jacobson, is uh, is out and uh, traveling today, but he's with us by phone. Today we'll be having public panel discussion on waste management in the Northwest Territories. Um, I'd just like to, while we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We also acknowledge and recognize all the indigenous nations of the Northwest Territories, the homeland of the Dene, the Métis, and the Inuvialuit. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. Due to COVID-19 situation in NWT, we're following the Chief Public Health Officers gathering restrictions in Yellowknife and the Legislative Assembly building is closed to the public. Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment will receive three brief presentations today. Each will be followed by a round of questions from committee members. Thus, Standing Committee, it is our role to review any legislation introduced in the House. We also identify priorities related to economic development and environment in the NWT. This panel discussion is one segment of public engagement the committee is undertaking to explore the topic of contaminated sites in the Northwest Territories. The committee has set the priority to ensure that the Northwest Territories is well positioned to prevent environmental liabilities, effectively manage contaminated sites, and stimulate local economic opportunities through remediation. The committee recognizes that landfills across the Northwest Territories may provide an opportunity to improve the management of contaminated sites and grow remediation skills in communities. The committee will continue to engage the public on this matter in the future and welcomes submissions and presentations. These can be arranged through the committee clerk. Previously, the committee has received public presentations from the Mackenzie Valley Land and Water Board and the Government of Saskatchewan's Institutional Control Program. In July 2020, while in Norman Wells, the committee met with the town council and local businesses to discuss opportunities to grow the remediation economy and also visited a few local contaminated sites. These presentations, site visits, and meetings all contribute to committee work with the intention to eventually make recommendations to the government. I would like to remind all members and presenters to direct all questions and comments to myself as chair and to wait to be recognized before speaking to help us have a smooth meeting. I will now ask members to introduce themselves for the record. Um, and we'll begin with, uh, what do we have on the schedule? Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jackie Jacobson, MLA for Nunukput. Mr. Ryan. Kylan Johnson. Kylan Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. It's not hey, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Oh. Katrina Knockleby. Sorry, Nockleby. Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. <laughs> One day we'll get this smooth. Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Oh, and I forgot on the phone we have uh, Caitlin. Ms. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Caitlin Cleveland, MLA Cam Lake. And I don't believe we have any others online with us from uh, the MLAs. Um, 
No, well, now, uh, I don't know, I think just for the record, if we can get the committee clerk to uh, maybe state who we have for staff in the in the meeting. I'll see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have myself, Jennifer Frankie Smith, committee clerk for the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. We have Ms. Jean Uris, who is the committee clerk trainee, and Ms. Amy Lazat is the committee advisor. Thank you. And I believe we have uh, James Thomas also on online with us. Uh, part of the staff. I will now uh, invite the representatives from uh, ENR to state your names for the record and proceed with your presentation. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just checking to make sure that everyone can hear me okay. Perfect. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to discuss waste management today. Um, my name is Yip Yung, um, and I'm the Director of the Environment Protection and Waste Management Division with the uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, just wanted to say that this week is Waste Reduction Week, uh, in case you didn't know, but I'm sure everyone who's attended are uh, super keen, so they probably knew that already. Um, and also with me today is uh, Heather St. Crawford, who is the Director of the Wildlife Division at ENR. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so today's presentation focuses mainly on community landfills and waste reduction and recycling programs and is structured as follows. First, I will begin to provide you with some key waste statistics. Then I will present some key issues and considerations to explain waste management in the NWT context. Then I will talk about where we are heading now and into the future of these programs. And then finally, I will end with implementation of the waste resource management strategy. Um, however, if there are questions with regards to contaminated sites, I would be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation as well. Next slide, please. So on slide number three, um, start, to start out with, I want uh, to give you a general sense of waste management in the NWT by presenting some key stats from 2016. So of the NWT's 32 community landfills, 20 of them contain stockpiles of hazardous waste. And this includes things like batteries, glycol, paint, used oil, and waste fuel. Another interesting fact is that the NWT has the second highest waste disposal rate in Canada at about 946 kilograms per person per year. This represents roughly 41,500 tons of waste in total annually. In terms of volume, this is equivalent to about 10 buildings the size of the Scotia Centre. And this is where I work. So it's quite significant. The majority of land, these landfills were built in the 1980s and the 1990s. And Yellowknife is the only facility that has an engineered land cell. The second table outlines some information that illustrates that not all landfills have the same infrastructure in place. This can lead to challenges such as increasing methane emissions, which contribute to climate change. Mixing waste streams and creating stockpiles of hazardous waste can harm the environment. Attracting wildlife, which creates dependency and conflict with humans and often leads to wildlife mortalities. And then finally, increasing our financial liabilities. Moving on to slide four. To help reduce the amount of waste making its way into our landfills, ENR currently operates three successful waste reduction and recycling program. The single use retail bag program, which has prevented almost 7 million disposable bags from being used annually. The beverage container program, which has kept over 10,000 metric tons of materials out of NFT landfills. For comparison, that's the same weight as the Eiffel Tower. And then finally, the electronics recycling program, which has kept more than 350 tons of waste out of landfills since 2016. This is equivalent to the weight of about three blue whales. Next slide, please. Slide number five. 
So moving on to slide five, I would like to provide some of the key issues and considerations around various types of waste management challenges, starting with community waste management. There's a growing concern about the amount of waste that's disposed in landfills, as well as increasing pressure, pressures to improve how we manage waste. We know communities need support to reduce, divert, and better manage waste. Some examples include assisting communities with landfill management and removing hazardous waste, reducing the amount of waste and creating, implement, creating and implementing recycling programs for different materials, and then finally, supporting communities with composting programs, which creates valuable soil amendments and helps reduce the impacts of climate change. We know that in the North, it's even more important to reduce the amount of waste generated at the source because of various challenges associated with recycling waste. First, it's very expensive and logistically challenging to transport all of the recyclables for processing to itself. Across Canada, it's actually becoming more increasingly difficult to find markets for household recyclables, such as paper, cardboard, and plastic. And I'm sure you've heard about that many times. And then the fact is, is that not every community has a permanent recycling depot in place. However, federal priorities associated with um, reducing single-use plastic provide some optimism optimism for future um, of waste management in Canada and in the North. GMT has also worked with communities to leverage federal funding to improve the state of waste management, which my colleague, um, Gerald, will talk to um, in a few minutes. And then finally, reducing waste and recycling creates <clears throat> more jobs and stimulates the economy. Currently, the GMT's recycling program generates 36 part-time jobs and 10 full-time jobs in the NWT and we hope to be able to generate more in the future. In the last fiscal year alone, recycling programs contributed almost $2 million to NWT businesses, including depots and protein centers, and providers of goods and services such as transportation, storage, equipment maintenance, and supplies. Slide number six, please. Thank you. So as you know, in 2019, ENR, in partnership with MACA, released the Waste Resource Management Strategy and Implementation Plan. The strategy is the GWT's 10-year roadmap to improving the state of waste management in the NWT. And I'll talk a bit more about this in a few, in the next few slides. Slide number seven, please. So now moving on to slide seven, I'd like to speak to some other challenges. Hazardous waste stockpiles and number of communities pose environmental and financial risks to communities and to the GWT. If these materials leak or spill, they may harm people, wildlife, and the environment, and also cause significant financial liabilities for communities, Indigenous governments, and the GWT. We have received short-term funding to remove hazardous waste from communities, and my colleague at MACA, Gerald, will speak to this. The GWT committed to assisting five to 10 communities to implement the Clean Up and Clean Start program, which again, Gerald will speak to in a few minutes. So by implementing the waste resource management strategy, we can reduce risk to human health, wildlife, and the environment. The division that I work for, Environmental Protection and Waste Management, we work closely with the Wildlife Division as well as MACA to ensure best management practices, including measures to reduce wildlife attractant and access to, to landfills. This will help mitigate human wildlife conflicts, which begin when wildlife has access to non-natural food sources. Slide eight, please. So now a few key issues considerations regarding cleaning up or remediating landfills. Landfills are typically not remediated. They are closed, meaning that they are capped and revegetated and then monitored to ensure the contaminants in the landfills are not leaching to the environment. So this is why it's so important for us to manage them properly. And because landfills are typically closed and not remediated in the sense of other contaminated sites, Landfill remediation will be a small component of the remediation economy. We anticipate that the landfill remediation will be touched on the, in the remediation economy discussion paper as it relates to more on the long-term management side of it. Slide nine, please. So now we've covered the current contacts for waste management. I'm happy to share that we are moving <clears throat> to where I'm happy to share where we are moving in the foreseeable future. In addition to the three waste reduction recycling programs we already run, ENAR has prioritized other waste materials and determined three new priorities. 
first, we plan on expanding the current electronics recycling program. Then we'll be adding tires and used oil. We are delighted today to announce the launch of the expanded electronic and electrical products pilot project, or e-pilot, as a first step. The pilot program will also allow us to collect data on the types and amounts of these products and the cost to collect them, transport and recycle them. It will also allow us to immediately prevent more materials from being disposed in our landfills. So just to give you a bit of context, the additional products that we are accepting as part of this pilot project, I believe there's something like over 500 materials. So they range from small home appliances to electronic gaming equipment, all the way to solar panels. And then finally, we expect to start working for programs for tires and used oil in the medium term, which is around year four to six of the strategy, once we've expanded the electronics recycling program. Slide 10, please. As I mentioned, the Waste Resource Management Strategy is the GWT's 10-year roadmap to improving the state of waste management in the NWT. The strategy lays out short, medium, and long-term milestones to be achieved within three, six, and 10 years. Priority actions identified in the implementation plan will contribute to reducing environmental liability associated with landfills across the NWT. The strategy has four goals, prevent and reduce waste at the source. The second one is to divert waste from disposal. The third is to improve waste management facilities and practices. And finally, lead by example by greening the GWT. The end goal of the strategy is to rethink the current model of making, using, and disposing of resources that is currently practiced in a linear economy and move toward a circular economy. Last slide, please. And that concludes my presentation for today. Um, thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to answer questions now or after everyone else has had a chance to talk. Thanks. Merci, uh, Madame Director. Um, I will now ask uh, committee members uh, or any members um, joining us uh, if they have any questions. I'll open the floor for questions. Um, I can't see any Mr. Chair? anybody else on the screen. Uh, Ms. Snockaby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, in my former life, I, I had a lot of ex interactions with community landfills, so uh, uh, I know a lot of how uh, what you're speaking to, and I'm excited to see this start uh, getting under control, although then uh, my former consulting colleagues may be out of work down the line. So um, I guess my question is around the e-waste uh, program. Uh, is there an opportunity for there to be uh, an, an economic recovery from that uh, program? I know at one point when they did a contract for the removal of the electronics from the uh, Yellowknife landfill that it did create some money in the uh, in the sense of of some metals that were being able to ta be taken out of the waste, etc. So I'm just curious to know if there's a bit of an economic spinoff from the recycling itself of those e-materials. Thank you. I see Ms. Nockleby, um, Madam Director, um, how, how do I say your name again? If you can remind me, Masi. It's, uh, it's pronounced Yip Yung. Can I go ahead and answer, Mr. Chair? Masi Cho, yep, yeah, uh, proceed. Um, thank you, uh, MLA um, Nockleby. That's a good question. And... Um, the reason why we started with the pilot project is so that we can get a sense of the types of materials that we're going to get um, at NWT uh, depots. Once we know, get a better picture of the types of materials, how much we're getting, and um, you know, the say for example, Yellowknife may have a different type of volume and materials that are coming back versus somewhere in Norman Wells. Once we do a bit more, um, once we have a good I guess, data set, then we will determine if there's better local capacity to be able to have more sort of, um, I guess, processing done in the north. Uh, one of the things that we do have to consider is the fact that um, 
we don't have a lot of volume overall when it comes to these programs compared to Southern Canada. Um, right now, the Alberta Recycling Management Authority, they manage the electronics program down there and they have uh, an approved, I believe, like maybe four processors in Alberta. And we generally work with Alberta because all of their processors go through an auditing process and they're very strict. And we want to make sure that anything that we do is within, falls within the same standard. Hopefully that Must answers your question. Uh, Ms. Nogleby? Yeah, it does. Uh, thank you. Um, so I guess that kind of touches upon the sort of balance of how much are we actually um, uh, saving the economy if we're having to transport these materials to the south. And then when you kind of look at that balance of the carbon footprint, you know, is it actually more detrimental to be putting these trucks on the road to get our stuff to southern Alberta or to Alberta uh, versus, you know, leaving them up here? So um, is there analysis being done to look at sort of the overall carbon sort of impact and whether or not, you know, stockpiling it here in the north makes more sense than trying to transport it to the south due to the small volume of everything? Thank you. Madam Director, do you have uh, anything? Um, yes, that's that's also another really good question, uh, Ms. Nokobi. And um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at uh, our annual report uh, that we um, table in the Legislative Assembly every year. With all of our programs, what we do is we actually calculate a um, like a net um, benefit analysis in terms of the amounts that we recycle or reduce versus all of the carbon associated with that product to process or to recycle it, um, say from Uluwaktuk, for example. We calculate the transportation. We calculate the transportation from the Nuvik uh, down to Alberta. And um, in fact, with the two recycling programs that we have in place now, there's definitely a net benefit when it comes to um, carbon dioxide uh, equivalent savings. And we'll be doing the same for electronics um, as we expand the program. Hi, Masi Cho. Um, we'll move on to uh, Ms. Liebling. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much to uh, Director Yung for the presentation today. Um, my first question is in regards to um, the NWT having the second highest disposal rates uh, of waste in the country. And I'm wondering if the GNWT collects um, data or even anecdotal as to why that is. Does it have to do with communities not receiving items that give them other options? Um, and I'm also wondering if the government also co collects um, specific data on what that disposal of waste is. So is it generally, for example, we mentioned today, uh, single-use plastics, or is it more to, is more volume coming from construction waste and then therefore government waste? Thank you. I see Ms. Cleveland, um, Madam Director. Hello, um, this is uh, Yip here, and um, that's also another really good question that uh, based on a report that we did in uh, 2016, um, I believe it's called like the State of Waste Management in the NWT, um, we did do some rough calculation on why it, or on our waste generation, or sorry, waste disposal rate. And there are probably many reasons why we have such a high rate of disposal, but part of that is because we actually don't divert as much as the average Canadian. Right now, um, Canada in 2016 has a waste diversion rate, which is like recycling programs in place. They're sitting around an average of 25%, and right now in the NWT, we're looking at around 11%. So we don't have as many waste diversion programs in place as Southern Canada, for sure, so that's one of the contributing factor. Uh, when it comes to the breakdown of residential waste versus the uh, ICI, or that's called industrial, commercial, and institutional waste, definitely that's one area that we are also looking at to ensure that we capture all the waste stream, not just the residential um, sector. And then one of the other things is that um, many, we have such a large land mass for the very small population that we do have, which makes it challenging to transport everything south. So those are, there are some examples, and 
with the exception of Yellowknife, which actually weighs their weight, um, the weighs coming into the landfill, most other communities don't have the ability to do so because there's not a weight scale at that particular landfill. I believe Inuvik might have it um, now. And one of the challenging parts of being able to keep track of that is because we don't have a scale at every single community. But what we do is we use a formula based on the compaction rate of waste compared to your average tonnage. And that's how we get the um, 946 kilograms per person per year. Answer your question? Oh, must uh, Ms. Leland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for that response. Um, I, and I guess my next question is in regards to transportation. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, like you say, there is such a cost to transportation and transportation in the north, given our land mass and given how spread out we are, out we are is a huge challenge. So I'm wondering if ENR has relationships set up with both MTS and trucking companies to do our best to ensure that any um, mode of transportation that goes into a community doesn't leave it empty. So that we're kind of capitalizing on any opportunity we have for potential of um, reducing those costs of transportation and making sure that we're, um, I guess, leveraging every mode of transportation that's already there anyway. Thank you. Must see for that, uh, Madam Director. Um, that's a really good point. I think that's something that we are working on now um, with our partners with the Department of Municipal and Community Affairs. And definitely there are there are trucks that come up to the NWT every day. Um, some of them are going back empty. And when we launch a program and we operate our program, we use um, backhauls uh, to take advantage of the rates as well as being able to do that across the NWT. Um, but in terms of using MTS, I think that's being looked at more with uh, with MACA, and I'm, I'm hoping that Gerald can speak to that a bit more with some of the work that they're doing uh, in terms of removing hazardous waste. But definitely great, great asset that we do have MTS and other transportation companies. Must see for, the, must see for that. Um, Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks uh, very much for the uh, the presentation. I I, uh, I noted that um, with tires and waste oil, it looks like it's still going to be another uh, three or four years, maybe before we're able to have a, a, a territory wide uh, program for them. But what happens with uh, waste oil and uh, tires right now in uh, in landfills? Thanks. Mr. Chair. Director. Um, just so that I am understanding you. So right now, uh, we have prioritized three materials. Um, we've committed to um, being able to implement three to five waste reduction or recycling programs um, by the end of the 10 year term. So tires and used oil definitely will start working on them in the medium term, not necessarily that they'll be finished within the next three to five years. We want to make sure that um, all the program that we do implement comes with a measured approach and we take the time to make sure that we do all the background research to be able to make it feasible. Um, for tires, I believe some of the communities right now um, are managing it differently. And I think Gerald might be able to speak to this a bit more um, at MACA. Um, some of them have applied for funding through the Waste Reduction and Recycling Initiative, which is an annual funding program that we have that communities can apply to. Um, some of them have shipped, it, shipped itself. Um, for used oil, I believe some ICI sector are definitely using it within waste oil burners. Um, but in terms of what we do with it across the territories, we're, we're still too early to know exactly what every single um, producer of used oil is doing right now. I believe some of them are shipping itself. Some of them are probably using Kavanaugh or KBL to um, to recycle that waste, um, but we don't have a good picture of that right now because it's sort of further down the road in terms of our research. Mr. O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for that response. Uh, I don't want anybody to go away with uh, the idea that I don't support this. Uh, in fact, I, I, I worked 
closely with YIP for uh, many years. I was on the Waste Reduction Recovery Advisory Committee for uh, 11 years. So um, they do great work. Uh, maybe you can just talk a little bit about the, uh, I think you mentioned there's uh, 36 part-time uh, jobs uh, that are created through the Environment Fund and 10 full-time jobs. Can you just talk a little bit about what those uh, jobs really are all about and where they're located and uh, um, sustainability of that, that kind of employment, that kind of thing, because I think that would be really helpful for our committee to know. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Director? Um, certainly, that's... Um, so annually, we, we assess how many jobs we provide and those numbers are calculated based on what depot operators tell us, and they're actually throughout the territories, um, not just here in Yellowknife. So wherever we have a depot, um, whether it's in Norman Wells or Tuck or um, Tuck or Saks Harbor, um, if there is a local depot in place, that that depot operator is counted as part of this um, this number. Uh, the reason why there's so many part-time jobs is because, as you know. We just don't have the volume to have a full-time depot operator, you know, eight hours a day for seven or five days a week. So that's why they're part-time. So all of these jobs are at the depots, um, regional processing centers, as well as depots all across the NWT. Let's see for that response. Um, I think we've gone through all committee members. Um, I just had a, a brief question. Um, does your department work closely with the Department of Lands when the, their inspectors go out uh, to assess um, environmental hazards on, on the lands, especially around cabins and, uh, and private homeowners? I see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I know we do have water resource um, officers and they do work with lands inspectors quite often. Um, I know that right now um, they're working on a project in the South Slave somewhere together to do an inspection and uh, definitely it depends on the, the site, like if it's a mine site or a house or whatever that may be. Um, it depends which where the, the contaminant um, is located, but definitely they, they do work close together. All right, must see for that. Um... Uh, since there are no further questions, we'll uh, like to thank you, uh, Ms. Yep Young and Heather Syene Crawford, for joining us today. Very much appreciate it. Um, I will now invite the representative from uh, Department of Municipal and Community Affairs um, to state your name and if anyone else with you, and you can proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, do you folks see landfill management panel? Yep, we do. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, solid waste sites in the, in the NWT. I'll be discussing very generally uh, the state of solid waste sites in the NWT. Um, and the three major stages in the life of a solid waste site. And I'm sorry, I guess I didn't formally introduce myself. My name is Gerald Enns. Um, I work with the, the Community Operations uh, Division uh, in MACA. I work for Olivia Lee and uh, Grace Lau. Um, um, I'll just uh, start from the top again. Uh, generally, um, the state of solid waste sites in the NABT uh, the three major stages in the life of a solid waste site and some of the challenges that communities are facing. And despite the challenges, we are excited about some new initiatives. So there's essentially a solid waste site in every community. Uh, municipalities operate their solid waste sites. MACA provides support, but we do not make decisions on how the solid waste sites are operated. They are regulated by a water license. The community has a water license issued by the Land and Water Boards. 
and that water license is enforced by the ENR water resource officer. There are um, 11 sites that we can safely assess as having 10 or more years of life expectancy in them. The remaining sites are a combination of sites that may need better management to extend their life, uh, or they may need to be expand to extend their life. And in a few situations, uh, there are some sites that simply need to close and we have to develop a new solid waste site. Um, in smaller communities, um, the solid waste site duties generally fall to the foreman or general staff who uh, work equipment or perform manual labor. Local contractors are used primarily in the regional centers. And as mentioned before, we're also aware of the, the stockpiles that have been accumu accumulating in some of these communities for decades. And uh, especially in recent years, we've become also become more aware of the problems that uh, wildlife are causing in solid waste site, as Yip discussed. So just to, to outline very, very generally, there's three major phases in the life of a solid waste site. The numbers on this slide are estimates and uh, the timelines and the costs vary between communities due to their size and location. For example, Tuk Tuk Tuk's new solid waste site uh, construction started in 2014, still not quite complete. And we do expect that the final cost will settle around $4 million for a new solid waste site. So once a site has been selected and land ownership is settled, uh, the construction is completed and it receives a water license, then it moves, uh, the community can move into the operational phase. MACTA is currently updating the water and sewer policy to include solid waste management funding, which would allow dedicated O&M funding, operation maintenance funding, to support the management of the solid waste sites in the communities. From an infrastructure planning perspective, we hope to get 30 years out of a solid waste site and 40 years is great. Um, as Yip touched on, the closure of a solid waste site typically requires groundwater wells, uh, engineered cover and continual monitoring. We should be expecting to monitor these for 20 years after closure at a minimum. And we work with the Environmental Liabilities Fund for the solid waste sites that will be a GNWT liability. Okay. Um, the operational side of the solid waste site is, is more public facing and it draws more scrutiny. Even though one of the most important factors in a good solid waste site is its location. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that communities are facing is that they are often not working within an engineered facility. It, uh, they are working in what has been historically an old dump, just a place where people throw things away. So it is hard to train someone uh, to manage a modern landfill in this context. Um, basic segregation can help a site put more of its limited capacity on the waste that create the majority of the nuisance, like domestic garbage. And generally speaking, communities do struggle to maintain trained staff at their solid waste sites, as well as mobilizing equipment uh, for compaction and cover and accessing granular material to cover their solid waste sites on a regular basis. Um, communities are also, they also struggle with the public relations aspect of closing the gate to restrict access. And this does limit the ability of communities to maintain uh, basic segregation and prevent liabilities from occurring. Um, just going to back up a little bit uh, to a question that came up. Um, tires basically are for the most part, they're segregated in their stockpile. So these tire piles are getting um, 
big. Uh, they're taking up space, and they're a fire hazard. Um, a lot of used oil is burned at used oil burners, or it is trucked out. Um, but there's like, a, besides uh, the used oil itself, there's materials associated with used oil, like the filters and the rags. And um, from my experience, I do see um, the, the, uh, pollution happening. I do see those materials in the active face of the solid waste site. Uh, managing the historic ch- stockpiles, uh, especially in our remote communities, has technical, logistical, and financial challenges. And expecting our remote communities to uh, manage them on an individual basis is not realistic. Okay. I was just discussing the operational phase. Um, so closure and post-closure. And this slide was just meant to outline that closing out a solid waste site is not a casual undertaking. It requires removing all those stockpiles and managing other bulky waste. But before we close it out, we have to find a good location for a new site and develop that site and get all the approvals in place. And closing out a site, as mentioned, requires putting that engineered cover material about a meter thick on top of the old cells, and then monitoring that site. So this life cycle view uh, motivates us to reduce waste, extend the life of our current sites uh, before we create new solid waste sites that require significant resources. Um, Just a brief slide. I don't have as many pictures as Yip does, so yeah, it's a bit text heavy. A brief summary of Mac's role. Uh, Capital planners and regional community works advisors help communities to manage their finances, uh, their capital projects, and all infrastructure assets. We provide technical support at any stage of the life cycle of the solid waste site. The department develops and delivers training through the School of Community Government. And we're currently exploring the idea of developing a certification course at a similar level to a water treatment plant operator in a similar uh, manner. We're currently providing project management support to one uh, community sewage lagoon and solid waste site upgrade project. And we're also exploring options to provide this additional level of project management uh, support to other communities been taking on an increasing role in tracking and promoting the status of municipal water license in each community. Uh, And one of our most exciting initiatives is is the successful application to the federal government for the removal of historic stockpiles of hazardous waste and scrap metal in the NWT. We received $5.7 million in funding for five regional projects. And we expect to free up the space to manage solid waste in the current sites instead of closing and opening new sites. So these projects coordinate technical and logistical support at a regional scale. We hope that the lasting effect of this project will be to establish a coordinated system of backhauling. Um, sort of speaking to the question uh, that Ms. Cleveland uh, asked earlier. We believe this would take the pressure off of municipalities to manage the disposal of equipment, uh, bulky materials, and hazardous waste from the ICI sector. So it's hard to frame this in the terms of a remediation economy but we believe that such a system would connect directly with most businesses and government who want to divert waste from um, local landfills, and it would provide them a reasonable outlet. It just does, it does require some coordination, and there are some models for this in uh, other jurisdictions, such as Alaska. The picture on the left illustrates 
a cleanup of hazardous waste stockpile that took place in Fort Simpson in 2019. And these cleanups have been happening in the past, uh, you know, five to six years. Every year there's a few communities that are actually getting rid of some of these stockpiles with opportunistic funding. Uh, in the foreground of the picture on the right, you can see some equipment in the higher tech that we need to deal with. And in the background, you can get an idea of how extensive, extensive some of the stockpiles of metal and has waste are. That's the hillside uh, adjacent to the waste site in Ulahatak. Okay, um, I'm running a bit over. Uh, some of the other initiatives that are taking place um, is a new solid waste standard that was developed through the Northern Infrastructure Standards Initiative. We have to see how that uh, will be adopted. There are composting projects uh, taking place in a handful of communities across the NWT. Uh, we also have uh, getting close to uh, finalizing a comprehensive risk index for solid waste sites so that we're mitigating the right risk factors in a community because they're different across the NWT. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Sorry, I went a little over here. Uh, Mussy, uh, uh, Gerald. Um, oh, you were you were right on time. There's lots of time. We're operating on dinner time here, so um, I'll open up the uh, floor for. Uh, committee members for any questions that they may have. Um, Ms. Knockleby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm really excited again to see all of this start uh, moving forward. As I said, I've really seen a lot of these landfills and, and um, you know, uh, they do need the work. So this is great. Um, my question is around land farms. Has there been much uh, discussed with within the departments about creating maybe not necessarily a municipal land farm in each community, but a regional land farm in order, and for people that are not aware, land farms are for remediating hydrocarbon contaminated soils. Uh, and it's, you know, just a time and turning process. So it's, it, it is something that could potentially be a bit of an economic uh, uh, opportunity in a community. So I'm just curious to know if that's been uh, explored under this new sort of these plans. Thank you. Uh, okay. Must see for that, Gerald. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we understand there are um, licensed land farms in, in Inuvik, Hay River, and Yellowknife. Currently, they're run by private contractors. Um, we have had land farms operate in solid waste sites uh, in the past and they don't have a very good track record of being beneficial to the community. They're, they're, they have been mismanaged and ultimately uh, resulted in liabilities to uh, the community. So the Satu region I think really could is is the one region where you know folks who have residential home heating oil spills have a very difficult time finding a place where to take that dirty soil. We haven't actively um, explored that feasibility, but it is something that we're actually currently undertaking in the in the waste resource management strategy, and we're doing that. We're sort of watching to see how this the this remediation economy piece is coming and coming at us a little bit sideways. We're watching how that's developing, but we are also tasked with assessing the feasibility of, of uh, remediating contaminated soil or land farming um, in the NWT, yes. Let's see for that, uh, Ms. Nockleby. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Yeah, and actually I, I had done some work on the Toledo land farm and, and um, 
I guess my concern along that is, um, you know, if there is an infrastructure that is there uh, already, I always hate to see that being removed. And, you know, if there is a, an opportunity to use it, um, especially in areas in the north where there isn't a lot of soil and, um, you know, places for that to, to cat materials to be sourced. So even if soils can be remediated to industrial levels, they do have a use uh, around the in the, the more northern areas. So anyway, just more of a comment on that, I guess. Uh, and I'm curious to see how that all plays out as well. Um, my qu next question is back around the tires. Um, has there been any sort of uh, innovative look at the usage of tires as a different sort of um, base building material at all? Like, uh, I know in the past, they've obviously been used for blasting mats, but you can only make so many blasting mats. So I'm just curious to know if there's, if we've looked at other opportunities for the tires uh, breaking them up and making them into road material. Uh, I'm, you know, just, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gerald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got a bin of tire shred in my office. I take it to meetings if anybody's interested. Um, so, yeah, tire, I think what you're speaking to is tire-derived aggregate, which we understand does have... Uh, you know, it has specific engineering properties, and we have met with the folks in infrastructure. Um, we were went to the city of Yellowknife, you know, um, landfill when they were shredding their tires, and all took a look at it, and you know, humped and hot. Okay, can we use this stuff? Um, it seems like there is definitely an opportunity for it's. It's like kind of downcycling. Like basically, you're taking a tire and you're downcycling into tire-derived aggregate, but then again, you're not you're not trucking it all out. And it it does it it basically requires, um, I think, um, engineers in the north to be familiar with tire-derived aggregate and to kind of establish um, a steady supply. And a certain amount of spec. Like if you're going to shred this tire, you got to shred it to spec, and so that the engineers can actually use it. And they need to know how much there is. So there seems to be an opportunity that could be sussed out a little bit further. Mm -hmm. We'll see for that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, next, we have uh, Miss Cleveland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much to Mr. Enns for the presentation. I find that um, there is, uh, sorry. Could hear, could hear a racket behind you. <laughs> down, turn it down, please. Sorry, Mr. Chair, there is a couple of uh, elementary school classrooms happening in the same house as me at the moment. Um, <laughs> So, no, sorry. Thank you for the presentation, um, and I'll make it quick here. My my first question is in regards to GNWT uh, waste. We're hearing a lot about the um, the process for, for not only setting up a landfill, but also um, training in the, in the community, uh, having to, down the road, remediate that, having to expand that potentially. And one of my... Um, I guess questions or concerns is that we're hearing a lot of exciting opportunities within the housing market right now. But what we hear from the housing corporation is that that includes a lot of remediation of their own uh, existing housing stock and then a lot of new build, potentially a lot of uh, renovations of old build that does have hazardous material and a lot of uh, construction waste that comes along with opportunities like that. And so does MACA work with the GNWT to set up um, an expectation that the GNWT remove its own waste from the community so that it's not increasing the cost for municipalities and the cost really of MACA and ENR to then come in and have to manage that waste. Thank you. Gerald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah, we definitely try, I guess primarily we support communities. And what we're also, we're encouraging communities to basically apply some gate control. And um, yeah, so, like sometimes getting rid of the old buildings in a community is a housing priority because you want to bring in a new house. And that's like, who can argue with that? But when that old building comes down, it's got asbestos and lead paint and mercury and 
Yeah, we do uh, work with communities to try. I think what we're really trying to do is is to get their bylaws up and communicate that to uh, GNDB departments. It's often GNDB departments uh, that are looking for a, a quick disposal option. It just the way it works. Not that everyone's doing a great job in what they're doing, but it does for sure put pressure on the communities. Um, again, coordinated backhauling is meant to apply to the entire industrial, commercial, and institutional sector. So we want to provide, help build a reasonable outlet alternative to local disposal. Um, and for any residuals, we want that solid waste site to have capacity. Um to manage some of the things that um, come from the from the housing corp, and maybe I might um, maybe I might also ask Yip if she has maybe a comment on this, Mister Chair. Can we ask Yip if she's got something she might want to add? Um, yeah, she can uh, respond if she'd like. Thank you, Mister Chair. Um, I actually put in the comment, may I add to Gerald's answer? So that's great that Gerald ca called on me. We work as a team really well, Gerald. Um, I just wanted to go back to what um, uh, Ms. Cleveland said earlier about, you know, what's the percentage of the residential versus non-residential waste? And I couldn't find that fact when you answered the question, but I looked it up. And so the non-residential waste, Seem to have frozen up there. Mr. Chair, Caitlin here. I see that Yip is no longer in our uh, list of, of participants yeah, I, in the meeting. Yeah, I, I see that. Yeah. Um, Madame Clerk, can we get in touch with her? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we're just watching to see if she is logging back in. I think she might have just gotten kicked off. So we'll keep her eyes open and let her back in as soon as she comes up. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we'll continue because we looks like we're going to have a, a panel discussion at the end. Uh, just to let you know, Gerald, I've been sending messages through the chat room, but uh, you can continue at this point. I see. It's about 60% um, industrial and 40% residential by mass. That's generally what we learn from our solid waste um, associations without doing a waste audit. If you were to, across North America, that's generally the breakdown. Ms. Liebland? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit in regards to training, and I'm wondering if Mr. Enns can speak to um, what type of training is is um, provided to communities, um, what kind of northern knowledge is is leveraged in in providing that training, and is the is is there a bylaw or policy that states that every community must have this training? Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'll answer the last question first. Uh, there isn't a bylaw or regulation in, in the NWT that states an operator has to be trained. Um, the training um, that has been offered to date is MACA's School of Community Government uh, typically offers one or two uh, classroom trainings, in-classroom trainings um, in a in a regional center, typically it's in a regional center, uh, where an instructor comes and students or uh, solid waste site operators from across the NWT attend in classroom to an instructor-led um, course. Uh, sometimes MACA staff instruct the course, and sometimes uh, a consultant has been hired in the past. And sometimes they've, they've ran the whole course for a community. I know that... Uh, 
They've done it a, a whole course in a small community. So that's offered one or two times a year. Um, and there's an exam. And then the, the, the School of Community Government tracks who has been trained and if, whether or not they passed uh, the exam. But it's not a certification course. Does that answer your question? Um, thank you very much, uh, Gerald. Um, we'll move on to uh, Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks, uh, Gerald, for your presentation. I know you used to work for ENR as well, so this is uh, good uh, uh, stuff that, that you've been working on for a number of years now. Um, and I, I get that a lot of the focus needs to be on uh, prevention and uh, improving our current management of uh, waste sites and supporting communities. So I, I, I get all that. I guess one of my concerns, though, is what happens to the old sites where there was no management. And um, I see, you know, that you're looking at segregating some of the waste out of those and shipping it out through the, this, uh, um, you know, federal uh, funding uh, program. But at the end of the day, I, I, I can't help but think that GNWT really has a responsibility to, to to manage and look after these sites. So how are they managed from a financial perspective? Are these entered as uh, sites in the um, uh, environment fund liability uh, uh, area that uh, Department of Finance um, handles and is reported through the public accounts? Is that how these sites are actually um, accounted for? Thanks. Gerald? Okay, well, I don't want to say the wrong thing here. I'll tell you what I know from a limited basis with regards to the Environmental Liabilities Fund. When a solid waste site um, goes into closure, and depending on the community, a lot of those liabilities for closing out a solid waste site, uh, particularly in our small communities and our non-tax-based communities, if land transfer hasn't happened without an environmental site assessment, and a lot of times land transfer hasn't happened, so we have lots of, we have a patchwork of land ownership um, that when the site goes into closure, the municipality is not no longer operating it, that the environmental liabilities for closing out that site are managed through the Environmental Liabilities Fund. That's correct, and that's through that's led by the Department of Finance and other departments. Um, for example, my managers and directors sit on the Environmental Liabilities Fund. I don't think I could get into any more specifics uh, than that without having the facts, without having actually my manager director here. We'll see for that, Gerald. Um, Mr. O'Reilly? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Look, and I'm not trying to put you on the hot seat in any way. Um, yeah, and I think it's probably going to, uh, we have, there's some new accounting standards that are being developed in this area and so on. So it's it's pretty complicated. But, uh, and of course, what we really want to focus on is prevention. And that's much of the work that you do. And I really appreciate that. You mentioned that there's a new solid waste standard that's, been developed or is uh, is out there now? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Is that done th under the Environmental Protection Act or uh, is it just uh, guidance at this point? Uh, and who's it really aimed at? Operators or uh, uh, municipalities or who? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Gerald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The the new solid waste standard, I, I went quick at the end of my presentation there, uh, was was developed through uh, a partnership with um, with the 
people from the NWT, Nunavut, Yukon, and other other professionals in a northern setting through the um got to get the acronym right here bear with me the northern infrastructure standards initiative nisi so nisi is 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 a is a large body um with people from nwtac uh, it is under development by the Standard Council of Canada. So it, it applies, it's meant to apply to the entire North. It's a robust standard. It's comprehensive. Um, but it hasn't been adopted into uh, legislation, uh, as far as I know, in any jurisdiction. And we should be cautious to adopt the entire standard as legislation. Uh, in the NWT, but it is something that professionals uh, can reference in a regulatory setting. Um, it is something that professionals can reference uh, for project management um, when issuing, when building a new um, solid waste site. But at this point, it is it is guidance. It's simply just guidance. Must see for that, uh, Mr. Jacobson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation, uh, Gerald. And um, just a couple of questions I have. Um, how closely is your department working with our small communities in, uh, in my riding of uh, Olakotuk, Sachs, Paltuk, and Kaktiaktuk? Thank you. Gerald? Okay. Uh, we do have uh, direct lines of correspondence with... Um, with uh, particularly Saks Harbor, Willahuktuk, and Polotuk, with regards to the um, the ICIP project, um, we understand Willahuktuk is applying for a new water license. Um, we are aware of um, the wildlife issues in that region, and <clears throat> excuse me. In in uh, in late June, we hosted. A, um, a workshop, a wildlife and waste workshop with uh, with actually all communities in the Beaufort Delta and the High Arctic. Um, we have uh, supported Saks Harbor with their with their water license. We are aware of the constraints there. Um, we have shipped totes up. Uh, to two of those communities that need them for the removal of uh, some of the hazardous waste. The totes are containers to put um, liquids into. Um, and we're just, we're just carefully watching um, tuck, 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 navigate um, the construction of this new solid waste site and how we're going to close out that, that old one. And either myself or my manager um, are in, in direct correspondence on a regular basis, either through the regional office or, or directly. I'm not, I'm not sure else, how else to, to say how closely we're working, but that, that is kind of how we are working in, in those four communities. And I guess, I guess if I'm going to add one more thing that we are hearing is the windblown debris and plastic blowing in the ocean, which has come up uh, recently. So we're just trying to get a fix on that, too. Must be for that, Mr. Jacobson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. No, yeah, Gerald, um, just in regards to that, I mean, um, I know MACA is working with our senior administrative offices in our communities, and I just want to make sure that information uh, is flowing and making sure we're not setting nobody up for failure and just kind of because our dumps are really in bad bad shape and we do need help on the cleanup and potentially that you know if we're able to to go in there with uh and get it loaded up like they do in alaska with mts with the barge and then just load up all the old equipment and tires and everything and get it out 
would have been a, a good plan to look at for the future. How they do it, like I said, how they do it in Alaska, and uh, and especially with the the bags, you know, uh, plastic bags from the stores is a big one too. But uh, no, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Must see, uh, Mr. Jacobson, uh, you want to respond to that comment, uh, Gerald? Yeah, we're. I, I don't have too much to add other than that. We're gonna. I think we we feel like we 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 do. We listen to communities as well as the hunters and trappers committees uh, as they have raised their concerns, um, particularly the visible uh, aspects of the of the solid waste site. Multiple issues. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Right, thank you, uh, Gerald, for your presentation and uh, for taking questions. And uh, we'll just hang around for the end of the, the next presentation to do a kind of like a panel discussion as uh, some of the committee members uh, want something uh, in that regard. Uh, is Peter uh, going to be from Cabinet Brothers uh, going to be doing his presentation? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. If you can introduce yourself, uh, your company, and uh, you can proceed with uh, any presentation you have. Uh, Masi. Thank you. Uh, I believe one of the admins is going to post my presentation. Uh, so to introduce myself, I'm Peter Howling. I own Kavanaugh Brothers Limited in Yellowknife. We provide waste removal and truck sewage collection services. Um, in the last four years, we've added waste solutions to our repertoire. So uh, on to the next slide, please. So we are now recycling tires, wood, scrap steel. Uh, we provide landfill services through consultation, landfill management, compaction, and organization. Um, I am a certified landfill manager and landfill operator with over 10 years of experience uh, in the north. I also chair the uh, Waste Reduction Recycling Committee, and uh, so I've sat on that committee with uh, several of the people in this meeting today. I also hold uh, a chair seat on the SWANA Solid Waste Association in North America, Northern Lights Chapter, which consists of Alberta, NWT, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So I will get started with my presentation. Um, I'd first uh, like to say thank you to the other two presenters. This is a a very broad, exciting new topic in the north. Um, we could be here for days, and I think many people share the same passion in this in this discussion. And uh, we're excited to be working with these groups. And um, I just want to, you know, clarify that as we are a private contractor, one could look at that and see some conflict. It, uh, the the scenario is real. We're a small territory. We have limited subject matter experts in the territory, and it's always a, a fine line that we have to respect. So I appreciate everyone's understanding. So after working uh, in the waste industry for over the last decade, uh, we want to offer sustainable and meaningful, meaningful waste solutions. Really want to focus on waste diversion tactics uh, that are applicable and achievable in northern communities. We've heard uh, many comments today about uh, other markets, whether it's e-waste, tires, and the, the solutions that our group is working towards is localized solutions. Uh, we have remote locations, we have high shipping costs, and many other challenges. Um, we also want to provide holistic approaches to landfill management and training uh, that will lead to sustainable programs for the future. Uh, efficiencies to be gained through approaches like backhaul opportunities for waste removal. Yeah. And then really focus on collaboration between public and private sectors. Um, my uh, presentation will show some examples on that. Next slide, please. So in 2019, uh, we were approached by MACA actually to uh, see if we could assist with the Saks Harbor community as they were uh, running out of room in their landfill. And initially, the scope was for myself to fly to Saks Harbor and uh, perform a site visit and put together a plan and, and recommendations for the community. 
And so the, the picture there shows what it looked like when I arrived, and uh, there wasn't a lot of space left. Next slide, please. So as many of you would appreciate, um, getting into a place like Saks Harbor, you can't fly in in the morning and leave at night. So uh, it was a two-day stay, which was amazing, and I really cherished that, that time there. So I did my initial assessment and worked with the SAO at the time, and uh, I said, well, it didn't take me too long to see and to, to know what could be done in the short term. So do you mind if, if I work with you guys and, and operate some of your equipment and, and uh, work with your people? And uh, we quickly hit it off, and in a matter of two days, uh, we were able to gain 1,800 cubic meters of airspace through basic sorting methods. And... This little trip was, was a huge eye-opener that led to a lot of uh, zest and new energy in, in, my, in myself to, to make a difference in the North. And, you know, my next slides are not to say what's wrong. Um, they're just to literally be honest and reflect on how things happen. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So was it a potential success story in Saks Harbor? Um, you know, for the two days of work that was completed, did I have enough opportunity to really uh, embrace segregation of waste and, and, you know, some basic skills for segregating the waste in the landfill to create airspace? Um, if I would have went there with, with a more formal approach of engaging the people and providing training and leaving them with something, I, I think that could have had a, a better lasting effect. Um, you know, is the landfills, are they closed for public drop-off? We use the landfills as transfer stations, and I think that's one thing that needs to be highlighted is there's a very big difference between what the dump or the landfill is intended to actually dispose of. That That's the material that either doesn't have a market, uh, as not will be... Um, stated earlier, it, it doesn't maybe make sense from a carbon footprint perspective. You know, there's many variables that we need to look at. But one thing we need to do is explore the opportunity of treating, using a landfill for actual landfill and creating transfer stations in communities. Um, there were intended plans for me to return to Saks Harbor. Um, they did not come to fruition. I believe there was some staff turnover and other reasons. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So I would, this slide is to really focus on the definition of project versus program. Um, projects temp typically result in temporary solutions with fast scopes and tight timelines. Our North American culture is very reactive, resulting in short-term corrections. Where I believe we need a cultural shift in the way we manage and the way we look at this project of cleaning up landfills or site remediation. Um, programs, they can create a long-lasting legacy. They can be a series of smaller projects that help create the program. These small projects must be more detailed and realistic for a defined market. Programs support new business as the work is repetitive and can secure lending, create long-term jobs, and have lasting effects. Next slide, please. So if we were to explore Saks Harbor as a program instead, and obviously, you know, this is just a, an example. I'm not saying that we could have done this one different, but it's, it's to open, use it as an example to open our eyes for future learnings. So we could have worked with the community staff to integrate segregation at the landfill, work with community staff to close the landfill to public and create a transfer station drop-off points for locals that landfill staff will then routinely move into the segregated landfill. Uh, hazardous waste should not even enter the landfill. Um, from the transfer station, it could be prepped for backhaul, and then the control of the landfill is maintained by the operators, which uh, then increases compaction and proper placement of waste, which extends the life of the landfill, which is ultimately one of the goals. Um, the other thing is create business opportunities for local uh, community bands, certain material from landfill, uh, cardboard, wood, steel, hazardous materials, etc. 
um, and then assistance provided to local businesses to collect banned materials at the new transfer site, so successfully dividing or diverting materials from the landfill. Next slide, please. So creating a program to start, reduce the scope and increase the timelines for increased success, ability to start with the pilot project and then transfer key learnings for the next locations, creating efficiencies, increase effectiveness and financial savings. It will give us the ability to support creation of new local business, allowing time for establishment. Um, it's also very important to identify and engage local champions. And I think this can be done through other existing programs. And we heard you talk about the next three to four years of the next products that are stated for an EPR stewardship program. And I think the great success of the existing programs like e-waste and single-use bags and beverage containers could almost help multiply the hours required for some of these operators. So we talked about multiple part-time jobs mm -hmm. where if we expand the scope to include hazardous waste preparation, um, a transfer station operation that would potentially create more full-time jobs rather than part-time. Uh, next slide, please. So I got a little ahead of myself there uh, on a collaboration through the existing profile or programs. And then we want to have as much work done locally as possible. Uh, that's bulking, labeling, prepping for shipping. There are certain aspects that require subject matter experts, but that doesn't mean that we need to have someone fly in and do all the work. Um, next, we need to fo uh, foster the collaboration between public and private sectors. Uh, we talk about markets, whether it's for cardboard, paper, uh, plastic, steel. We've seen a huge upswing in, in the cardboard fiber market recently and also in the steel market. Steel can be selling up to $400 a ton for clean heavy right now. Um, the private sector may, is able to adapt to these shifting markets where the public sector might have bylaws or, or other uh, regulations that need to be changed so that they can either sell or divert product and change tipping fees according to market commodity values. So I think that's where you know, the private sector has its areas that can perform well, uh, but there's also areas that the public sector uh, manages a lot more effectively than private. So how do we figure out the right balance? Um, we also need, uh, you know, the opportunity of cross-training between waste management sites can then be transferred to remediation cleanup projects. So when we look at all the small communities and close relation to many of these reme remediation projects, if we have staff that have learned through the landfill, they can then be utilized on these other projects, which creates economic development and keeps the money in the community or the region. Uh, the next one is a huge one, and uh, it's creating a, of a backhaul program. Uh, this is recently we we bid on uh, two RFPs to clean up uh, landfills and remove hazardous waste and scrap steel in the Anuvik region and the Satu. Um, one of the most challenging pieces of our proposal was coordinating through a JWT shipping entity. And uh, it, it, it's quite amazing because I, I was on a flight the other day coming out of Yellowknife and the gentleman next to me worked for an entity and I was asking them what type of materials they backhaul. And the answers were, we only backhaul some of our equipment from the other ports. And so here we have a, an amazing opportunity. Rather than focusing on what's not happening, I would like to focus on what the opportunities are. And I... My suggestion would be is that we look at and explore the opportunity of creating some sort of memorandum which requires backhaul, and that could start internally with the GNWT. So considering that we're bidding on GNWT work through MAFA and infrastructure to clean up these sites, but yet we have GNWT barges going home empty, it, it's quite interesting that we're in that state. And I, what, But what we need to do is start small. So back to the... The program approach is utilize the tools that are available and start with training. And training and public education are key in any program. So the program, uh, the training program can can uh, 
build the local jobs and engagement. You know, we're going to create cost savings locally, territorially. Um, those small projects are going to help form the program. And there's lots of creative uses for materials locally and, you know, companies like ours. And I'm not here for a sales pitch. Um, I'm actually here as part of passion and my civic duty as a as a, a business owner in the north to help. Um, so we shredded 100,000 tires at the LNA landfill. Um, majority of those tires were u- reused on site and the staff there uh, had huge success. For example, there's a waste compactor that needs to travel from one cell to another and there's high wear on the wheels from traveling over frozen ground or uh, hard stones and so they use the t- tire derived aggregate as a road based material which will be soft and not freeze in the winter for this machine to travel on so the decreased wear on their and uh, on their machinery which you know is going to create cost savings and found another use um, we recently have been exploring the opportunity of of uh, turning waste wood from the landfill into energy uh, through biomass heat um, we've just got our lab results back, which uh, have proven that the characteristics of the wood chip from waste wood in the landfill in Illinois is a very similar quality of wood pellets. So when we talk about the carbon footprint, there's a great example where we could divert up to a 1,000 tons a year from that site um, and create free heat and eliminate the need for trucking the wood pellets from northern Alberta to Yellowknife. Um, there's lots of other examples we could talk for hours, um, but I, I would like to just uh, talk about one other item. Uh, the Swana Conference is coming to Yellowknife in 2023. Uh, this conference has never been to the Northwest Territories, and it's going to be a huge opportunity to collaborate with a lot of the communities, um, have training, awareness and uh, all done at a, a one location in the north so that will uh, lower the cost of travel and uh, we're we're doing a lot of neat things in the north I don't think anybody in the waste sector should be upset with where we're heading uh, the GNWT has been, done a great job uh, with its new strategy um, many other communities are working working hard towards their goals and I think it's just a, a new beginning of opportunity and environmental protection. So I, I thank you for the opportunity inviting me and uh, the opportunity to share my opinion uh, on this sector and hopefully it's of use. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, it's very valuable uh, information there uh, regarding uh, private private sector running uh, landfills. Uh, and, it's, and it sounds like a great uh, business opportunity for many of our small communities as the regional municipal governments uh, kind of put their arms in the air sometimes about uh, controlling their landfills. Um, I also just want to note that I was not aware that uh, we were going to have a panel discussion at the end of uh, of all the presentations as we did uh, questions for MACA and ENR. So I'm just going to open up uh, the floor for committee members that they would ask any specific questions related to uh, Peter's presentation. Um, I didn't see anything in the message board, but uh, Ms. Cleveland, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. And thank you very much to Mr. Howling for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if we can leverage a little bit of uh, Mr. Howling's uh, role within the city of Yellowknife. Um, And I'm wondering if Mr. Howling can speak to what types of public education uh, that he found had the greatest impact on the landfill in Yellowknife here. Thank you. I must see Joe Peter. Yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, yes, Ms. Cleveland, uh, we've had many programs, uh, different approaches, and the probably the one item that has had the most impact on the residents of Yellowknife was the curbside car program introduction, where the uh, city of Yellowknife introduced the organics recycling program. 
and that uh, that project was, as the SAO at the time of introduction stated, was the most impact on the city of every resident at one point in time. And the the uh, the reality of that program was that it changed every household, and many people have stated that while their awareness was quite low prior, once they started using a kitchen catcher and a green cart out at the curb, they realized that 40% of their waste was recyclable through an organics recycling program, which then created um, usable compost for gardening uh, and also reclamation work at, at the city landfill because soils are of not abundance in the region. And there was also a lot of key learnings that while we thought we were explaining everything to each homeowner, uh, you have to explain 10 times of what you think so that every every individual is able to adapt their household to that program because the options and, and differences between households are endless. Uh, Ms. Liebling? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much to Mr. Howling for that response. Um, one of the things that Mr. Howling mentioned frequently throughout his presentation was the aspect of training. And so given Mr. Howling's uh, experience with waste management and then also his experience of uh, being able to work in different communities throughout the Northwest Territories, I'm wondering if Mr. Howling can speak to the aspects that would be really important in a training program for communities to be able to capitalize and kind of leverage, you know, innovation and being able to move forward in the current climate of waste management in the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Peter? Yes, thank you. Um, this has been a topic on, at our SWANA board, especially in, in uh, relation to the upcoming conference in Yellowknife. And the one aspect that myself and another uh, chair on the committee has brought forward is, is making it work for the community. Each community has a different culture, different climate, different landscape, and we can't just take a blanketed approach from what might be a typical landfill operation basics training course through SWANA in the south. And we really need to tailor and respect the culture and the lands of the people in the north and engage those people so that it is relative to their lifestyle. And um, I think it's important to champion uh, northerners or people that have grown up in the north and understand the culture and respect the culture to help uh, roll out that training. Um, the Back to that collaboration with the other programs, I think that's where we'll find cost savings and efficiencies because we can utilize some of those same people that are champions in individual communities. Let's see, Peter, and uh, must see uh, Ms. Cleveland for your questions. Uh, next up, I have uh, Ms. Knockleby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the presentation. I'm pr familiar with a lot of the work that you guys are doing um, across the north, and I think it's great. Um, when you look back, uh, particularly your KBL arm doing environmental work, uh, you know, when I first got up here, it was a new company or it just was just starting. And, and now it's a, it's a force in removing a lot of waste from our, our uh, stream. So I guess my, my question is, um, is there capacity in the north, in, in your opinion, for other sort of hazardous waste management type facilities where rather than shipping things down, do we have the ability to actually become a receiver of those types of materials? And is that an economic arm that we should be maybe looking at too for the remediation economy? Thank you. Peter? Yes, thank you, Ms. Knuckleby. Uh, it relates back to your earlier question on the e-waste. And the, I believe the topic that was brought up was volume. Um, so when you look at the territory, we have approximately 40,000 people. Um, if we compare that to a southern entity, say Grand Prairie, that I think is sixty to eighty thousand, they don't, uh, they aren't the end, end resolvers of hazardous waste, because the the model would require so much capital investment for a plant or whatnot to bring that material back to uh, a point of selling as a commodity. So, but. If we look at where you're heading with your question, in my belief, um, 
is regional approaches is, would be very effective. So when you look at the Inuvik region, there's, no re- there, there's great opportunity for local economic development to have a partner or uh, do a pilot project where they would be a regional transfer station, um, possibly even to the point where maybe we should be back hauling waste from some of these tiny communities that only have 90 people. Um, you know, as a waste hauler, we have apartment buildings that have 300 people and we're hauling one bin a week. So, and that's not even compacted. So if we start getting into diversion, segregation, compaction, um, majority of the South uses a regional approach. Uh, there's other mayors, the mayor of Haver, our post, the pre-mayor of Haver, have talked about the regional approach for the South Slave. This is a model that's used widely across the world. They don't have a landfill in every little area. They have a landfill in Saskatoon, and for a 250-kilometer radius, all all users use that landfill. And I think those are the ideas that we need to start investigating and investing into. Um, Ms. Knockleby? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think you, you kind of understand where I'm coming from. Um, and having where I grew up, we didn't have, uh, well, we had a landfill when I was quite young, but then it became a transfer station. And uh, as most, maybe some people don't know, all of the lower mainland of BC sends their garbage into like Cache Creek, et cetera. So uh, after it has been segregated and diverted at the, uh, at the transfer station. So I guess just more of a comment. I'm excited to see where this goes. I think we have a lot of opportunity up here. Um, there is, you know, sort of chat or had been years ago about sort of the, a new stage of mining will be mining old land bills and, and such for the e-waste or, or capturing the methane to, to use as, as an energy producer. So um, I do see a lot of possibilities in this area for the north. So I guess I just want to say thank you for your company's uh, commitment and yourself for doing this work. Thanks. Uh, Peter? Yes, thank you, Ms. Nockleby. Uh, we're excited too. I think the the model that needs to be explored, whether it's from, you know, any of the entities that I'm involved in ownership or other private sectors is partnership. Um, we don't need everybody to be an expert, but not everybody can do the work either. So what our focus uh, as a group is, is to create long lasting partnerships and provide the expertise when needed, but not take away any of the work that is for local entities and that's where I think there's there's need for some really hard conversations and what does that look like? And we always, you know, talk about these ideas at the high level, whether it's through local government, private enterprise, but are we talking to the stakeholders? We need to go to the communities. We need to hear from those people. Uh, what do they want? What are their capacities? Do they have interest in running a transfer station? You know, sometimes the change, um, adaptive, willing to adapt from one region to another, uh, we can't put a blanket on it and call it all the same. And understanding our people, when we rolled out the organics collection program, I, I felt very minute once I understood what a true program felt like and when you affect that many lives and you really need to have a lot of respect for any action you are asking those people to complete on a daily repetition. So thank you. Thank you for your grants, and uh, it's fun to see your smile on the topic. Lussie, Peter, for all that, uh, I don't see anyone else on the message boards or anything uh, for further questions for Peter. Um, Oh, I see someone uh, waving frantically on the screen. He looks like small on my screen, but he's got a big voice. Mr. O'Reilly. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I didn't know that I was waving frantically, but I um, appreciate that. Yeah, I guess um, I'm kind of interested in hearing from the the whole panel, that we've, now that we've got them all here, um, about how we can most effectively... Um, work and train uh, folks from the communities. And I think, Peter, you're starting to get into that. Like, And I know that, Gerald, you talked about the School of Community Government is offering some kind of um, program for solid waste operators. But, uh, 
like if, if folks come in to, to Yellowknife for the School of Community Government, do they are they actually taken out to the, the, the Yellowknife Solid Waste site and shown around or, you know, do they get some hands-on experience working at the site for a week or something or what? And, and I don't know, Peter, uh, and what, what's the most effective way we can um, kind of work with communities to to uh, support them to um, retain that kind of expertise and, and knowledge? So uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Let's see, Mr. O'Reilly, I guess uh, we've just begun our panel discussions. Uh, so we'll put it across the board. Um, we'll start with uh, with uh, Gerald, I guess, Gerald and uh, Yep, and then Peter, Masi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Pete mentioned earlier, we can't provide a blanket approach. Uh, anytime there's a training course in Yellowknife or in a regional center, that part of the course is always going to the to the solid waste site, uh, uh, for sure. Um, one of the things that we have realized, and we would like to, I guess we're exploring in our course as well, is that any kind of classroom training course is actually complemented with uh, an operator going to their own site and working along someone else who is a trained operator as well. A kind of either a mentorship or, or bringing in a contractor to work with the staff and say, cover waste here, segregate um, this waste here in the context of their solid waste site because the books and the pictures never really capture what goes on in an individual community and their local and their, and their individual challenges. So that's one way that is really the best way to train in my opinion. Thank you. Let's see, Gerald, I'm not sure. Yep. You have anything further on that? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, not too much to add to Gerald's comment, but I absolutely agree. I think something that Matt is working on is trying to see how training can be more hands-on for communities and uh, also recognizing that um, there's a lot of turnover in some of these communities for operators and you could have, you know, you could train somebody one month and then three months from now they're gone. So I think something else that needs to be done is more training hands-on, but also on a regular basis to account for some of that turnover, and that would be really helpful. And definitely a mentorship program of some sort where um, an operator goes out with a train operator at their own facility because the equipment's going to be different in um, in Toledo than it is going to be in Yellowknife, and we want to make sure that we sort of gear it towards what the community has in terms of infrastructure, not only in their own facility, but also in the equipment that they're using to manage the, the landfill. Thank you. Must see for that. Uh, it almost sounds like uh, we need dedicated people in this area, and it could lead to uh, a business venture. Uh, Peter? Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so definitely agree with the points that were made uh, by Gerald and Yip. Um, I, back to the program approach, are we going to run across the north and clean everything up at once and then leave? Or are we going to go into each community and develop a plan that is, say, has an annual or every second year transfer of, of materials out? And I think that's the, oper that's the pivotal change in my professional opinion is a single project uh, is not going to create a lot of excitement where uh, if we can say, hey, this is a business you can do forever in your community, you're going to have better investment and buy-in. And I think that's where the program and the programs have showed success already. Must see for that, Thank Peter. Okay, one more for Mr. O'Reilly before I move on. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. No, I'd rather have somebody else go ahead uh, with the okay. approach, maybe do one at a time. 
All right, that was going to be my suggestion to the message board. Uh, I'll allow uh, Miss Cleveland, since her question wasn't uh, completed by yep, uh, uh, to ask a question to the panel. Let's see. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to hear um, any statistics coming out of ENR to help us better understand what makes up a lot of our landfills. Um, I'm also happy to ask uh, a question to the panel. Um, one of the things I find when we're starting to talk about budgets is that um, a lot of times we look at programs that are already happening or in our term anyway, a lot of our budget conversations are generally quite status quo because the government is quite strapped right now. And I guess my, my question for the panel is if finances were not a, were not a crutch, I guess, or were not an, a, a challenge, what does the panel believe would be the biggest benefit to waste management in the Northwest Territories? Thank you. I see Ms. Cleveland. Um, I'll start with uh, the same order. I'll go with Gerald and then, uh, yep, and then Peter. Gerald? Hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cleveland. Uh, we understand that, like, our subject matter does not, does not really grab headlines. It's never going to be a high profile um, item. We're always going to be grasping uh, for funding. So the best thing we can do is communicate uh, to you folks where we see uh, synergies. Uh, for example, if we want to divert waste and um, along the lines of composting, well, composting is mentioned uh, in the climate change strategic framework. It's mentioned in the agriculture strategy. It's got two or three other benefits uh, associated with it. So if it's seen in that light, uh, it's not a liability. All of a sudden, we're doing three things at once. We're reducing greenhouse gases. We're reducing leachate. Uh, we're mitigating fire risk. And arguably, we're mitigating wildlife risks, um, as well as generating compost, we're just start, starting to see that it's not a lie, but it's, it's, it, it, it's not um, costing money. If we take a close look at how quickly some of these solid waste sites are depreciating because of the environmental liabilities that are accruing, we start to see that uh, getting rid of these hazardous waste stockpiles is fiscally responsible. First of all, it's fiscally responsible, as well as, um, you know, preventing the release of uh, contaminants. Um, another metric that is, obviously, we're counting greenhouse gases now. Um, I think it should be noted that um, while we're still vetting the numbers, uh, moving a ton of cargo on a barge has less greenhouse gas emissions associated with it than moving a ton of cargo on the highway. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, present a unique opportunity, and it's just simply a matter of, of not um, uh, counting $1 spent for one risk factor. It's often multiple. And the fact that an improved solid waste site connects with virtually every resident in the NWT. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question. All right, Mussie, so Gerald. Uh, that jumped to my mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right, Mussie, for that. Um, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. My apologies. The, the only day that the internet doesn't work at work is today. <laughs> so I'm using my phone. <laughs> um, first, uh, I'd like to just maybe answer um, Ms. Cleveland's uh, question earlier on, is that I would say about now roughly 60% of the waste that we produce in the NWT comes from the non-residential factor or sector, which is um, things like hospitals, um, commercial sector, so the ICI sector. So we're talking about hospitals, um, buildings where there are like housing units um, and that area actually has a lot of opportunities I guess because 
the GWT, for example, runs a lot of our buildings. We have the probably one of the biggest assets in the GWT. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to be a leader. And that's where the greening government comes in, is to ensure that, you know, we as a GWT show some leadership, that if we're asking residents to do all of these things, that we should also be doing some of these things. Um, in terms of what um, Ms. Cleveland said here about, you know, if money wasn't an issue, what are the biggest bang for a buck? Um, I would have to say reducing waste. I know that we always talk about um, recycling, but really when you think about um, the waste hierarchy and if you think about it as in terms of, you know, the gold standard, the silver or the bronze, reducing waste is actually the gold standard. If there is a way that we can reduce our waste and never produce it in the first place, that's where we can gain a lot of benefits. Um, so a lot of education and, and you know, showing how, how we can do that to residents is definitely a uh, very low-hanging fruit. Um, the second one is, I agree with Gerald, composting. It is about 40% of our waste stream. And um, if we can do that, it solves a lot of problems, not only from um, the management of landfills and it come, what, all the way to, you know, reducing climate change impacts. And then finally, I think regionalization is an area where we should really explore more. And it's not just for waste management and transfer stations, but also for things like um, recycling. You know, like we, we don't need to have a landfill in every single community if there are access to a road access that is within a reasonable distance. Let's take a look at that and see how we can manage that better so that uh, we don't have 32 landfills, but perhaps we have 20 and they're more well-managed facilities versus a combination of a variety of things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Must see for that. Um, Peter? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, number one on my list is more from a hands-on approach because that's what we do, uh, would be depollution. If we can start training immediately uh, local entities to do de depolluting, you are now storing a lot of inert waste. Uh, once a vehicle hulk is, has its oil and gas, different fluids removed from it, it is now just an inert piece of steel sitting there. Um, does it have risk to affect wildlife and vegetation? For sure, but at a much smaller uh, percentage, uh, removing freon from appliances. These are these are not very technical jobs, but what they do need is is someone just to go in and get the right equipment and, and back to creating a program. Uh, and then next, the two biggest things that I've seen personally um, in a landfill in the North Slave region and then in the Beaufort Delta was hitting on the points that Gerald had stated in the comment section of segregating, storing, and shipping. So in both cases, we really didn't do any shipping. We segregated and increased how things were stored. And that tied into the aspect of majority of the landfills in the north have some form of an engineering design associated to them or at one point or time have been assessed by a firm. And those firms typically put a lifespan on the landfill because that's what's required by reporting and, and other regulatory boards. So what happens is that date, we'll say 2030, hypothetically gets into everyone's mind that their landfill is only good till 2030. Well, in the case of the North Slave region, that our uh, landfill we worked with, we took their landfill that was supposed to close hypothetically in 2023 as per an engineering report and uh, completed a bunch of compaction and then new processes for segregation. That same landfill is now going to operate till 2035. So when we're looking at a $4 million in Tuk 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 uh, landfill construction project or we're looking at a cell for the city of Yellowknife for seven years at $3.3 million, the compaction and segregation is huge. So if we can teach proper compaction methods alone, that can increase landfill space by 50%. Um, and obviously there's drainage and a bunch of other things that need to be adhered to, but those are just some, some really basic hands-on skill sets or a certain piece of equipment. And that, that's where I feel we can make the biggest impact 
uh, initially, and in a lot of cases, the communities have the right equipment. They just have never had someone show them to connect the dots. Thank you. Must for that, uh, Peter. Um, next, I have uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to every, all the presenters today. I found this very informative, and I, I think committee is going to come away with some good recommendations on, uh, you know, segregation, compaction, more regional model, regional models, and you know, some of the the backhauling we could look at through the valley. Um, but I, I guess I have a. I want to ask a question which opens up a whole other area, perhaps, you know, a bit beyond the scope of this presentation, which is, you know, when I, we, when I look up the valley at the garbage that and the waste that's going to be coming in over the next years, it's a lot of uh, demobilizing Norman Wells, it's uh, demobilizing a lot of mine sites, it's uh, a lot of aging GNWT infrastructure and buildings that will end up in the waste, uh, you know, Tuck is also has a lot of buildings that eventually, you know, it it's a lot of very old industrial construction materials. And I, and I guess I would be welcome any input on, you know, some things we should consider as we, as we do that work, you know, we put it back into landfill, you know, any ideas from other jurisdictions that people are doing in regards to refurbishment or, or, you know, perhaps what we should have done differently in the first place. I just think about the number of housing units alone that the Housing Corp is probably going to have to put into landfills over the next decade or two. And it's, a, it's a very significant impact on all of our landfills. So, yeah, I'm curious about that end of, of that large scale infrastructure that both GNWT and industry own, of, of what we should be doing differently to prevent it, you know, ending up in the waste so rapidly in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's see, Mr. Johnson, um, I'll just switch up the order a little bit here. We'll uh, begin with uh, Peter, and then, uh, yep, and then Gerald. Uh, Peter? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, great, great question, Mr. Johnson. Um, I will speak more from the private enterprise side and the experience that we've had. Uh, one aspect that has that needs to be explored or practiced more, more routinely is uh, efficient demolition. Um, recently, we uh, were partners in dem demolishing a local dealership, old car dealership in Yelnay. Uh, out of that whole building, uh, there was only three roll-off bins of waste that went into the landfill in Yelnay. Um, there's a typical process of you just tear the building down and you fill trucks or trailers or you know, garbage bins with the waste and it all goes to the landfill. Um, recently, you know, the system school, I think, was a, a huge success story that the GNWT really embraced. And that's the start of a new culture of demolition. I definitely um, agree with your points. There's There should be look into reuse before demolishing. But if we get to the end state um, of demolishing, it can be done right and the impacts are quite minimal. Masi, for that, uh, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there are two things I will say. Um, we are actually working on, um, with the Department of Infrastructure, a um, starting to work on a feasibility study, I guess, to determine um, on the deconstruction of a building and whether that's feasible or not. So we're, we're trying to see, okay, if you're demolishing a building, how much labor does it cost to do that versus how much labor and overall cost is it to take apart certain materials that you can reuse for another project? And that's something that I think I'm, I'm really excited about to see. You know, are there ways that we can find uses for an old building where we're not just demolishing the whole building and taking it to the landfill, which like other members of the um, presenters here have already mention it's very very expensive to create a new landfill and then the other thing that i will say is the whole idea of a, a circular economy i guess right now a lot of how we think about waste is all about you know extracting materials uh, from the earth manufacturing the product transporting it um to market using it and then we dispose of it we need to shift that thinking away to a more circular economy model where we're trying to keep that particular material 
in life for as long as we can. And we try to recover it. We, we try to regenerate products from that material instead of just, you know, a linear where we're saying, okay, produce it, dispose of it at the end of its life. So it means, you know, choosing to buy products that last longer, um, have the ability to be recycled, have the ability to be refurbished and reused again within that life cycle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Merci for that. Um, Gerald? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you uh, for the question. <clears throat> I guess I won't add too much, but further to what um, uh, Peter and, and Yip said, I think, I guess one of the assumptions that we're kind of working on right now is that, that burying garbage doesn't cost anything when in fact it is actually costing us quite a bit. We're just not, it's just the way we're accounting for it right now. And as technical experts, we're kind of like, we're focused on finding better ways to bury garbage or better ways to divert waste. But for example, one thing I think that MACA is, um, and I think we're, with the help of ENR and everybody's, one thing we're getting close to is, is actually valuing the cost per cubic meter of airspace in a solid waste site. Now that sounds a bit abstract, but like in a landfill, it's the it's the airspace that you're filling up. That's your asset. That's what's costing you money. When we get that metric, and I think we're I'm not going to promise anything, but we're working on it. It's 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 a it's complicated across the NWT. But I think if we were to get that metric, we would see um, how feasible it is to reduce the volume and of, of these wastes or reuse materials. I think it's, it has a lot to do with the way we're doing our accounting to sort of really articulate the benefits of goals one and two of the strategy. Thank you. Well, see for that, Gerald. Um, <clears throat> next I have uh, Ms. Knockleby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, I'm glad uh, Mr. Johnson raised the question I was going to bring up because I believe in BC there's a lot of regulations around how much uh, must be stripped and recycled from buildings before they are allowed to be demolished and, and put into landfills. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear that this is uh, something that is being uh, looked at. So I guess I'll just shift my question then. Um, back to sort of the conversation earlier about how the composting program made uh, sort of that impact on each individual person and waste really being a very, uh, something that impacts everybody, yet we don't really uh, pay a lot of attention to it. So I guess my question is a bit around, or just want to hear people's comments around the single-use plastics, etc. I am a single person who lives a lot off of like deli takeout and uh, ordering from restaurants, etc. I'm, I'm more than happy to pay more for compostable um, recycle uh, containers, etc. So I'm just curious to know where uh, you all see the territory going with these single-use plastics. Do you think it's feasible for us to remove them? Uh, are we looking at a, a, a you know pay system where if you don't, like we do with the plastic bags, you pay a quarter, whatever. So um, maybe just the panel's thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, see, Ms. Knockleby, for that very important question. Um, I'll start with uh, Yep, and then go to Gerald, and then then finally Peter. Uh, yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I said, I think previously in answering um, Ms. Cleveland's um, question about, you know, what are the, the great impacts that we could have? And I mentioned reducing waste. So you may be aware that the federal government is, um, has currently plans to um, ban or reduce the use of single-use plastic, recognizing that, you know, it's being used a lot right now in our society. Um, everything from medical equipment and supplies um, all the way to restaurants. And it's not easy <laughs> to, to think about a life without plastic, for sure. Um, I do think that the federal priority um, is something that um, needs to be looked at. And definitely through the Canadian Councils of Ministers of the Environment, um, the all the ministers from the federal, provincial, and territorial governments have actually agreed to work on something to reduce plastic. 
And uh, there was a, a strategy that was passed in 2018 and then an action plan that was put in place um, as recently as I believe the phase two action plan for single use plastic was in 2020. Um, one of the things that we committed to doing in the strategy is looking at ways that we can reduce the use of single use plastic where it is actually um, that we don't need. For example, we do have a single use retail bag program. There's no reason why uh, we have to use plastic bags, for example. Other things such as, you know, disposable cups, um, straws, all of those that make our lives very convenient. Do we actually need to use them? Because if we think about the whole life cycle of a product, um, can we maybe just use a, a fork that lasts longer and we don't have that waste at the end? I think that's a really, really good question. I think that's definitely something that we want to think about as we move um, to implement our strategy is what are the things that we can actually do fairly easily to promote more waste reduction as opposed to try to recycle it because really like I said recycling is like the bronze metal not not the gold metal so definitely federal um, priorities is in there Canadian Council of Ministers environment is in there and it's in our strategy to look at how we can reduce um, single use plastic. Merci for that yep uh, and I hope we work towards the gold medal uh, anyways uh, Gerald We work closely with ENR um, as we we sort of like watch what uh, uh, becomes a priority for single use, and we help communities stay apprised apprised of waste uh, reduction strategies in our training courses, in our conversations, uh, that type of thing. But mostly, we just sort of follow ENR's lead. On, on, on the single-use plastics and Canada's and just sort of stay apprised and, and communicate that to communities. And, and from an infrastructure planning perspective, we're just asking, trying to get communities to cover their waste so the bags aren't blown all over the place. Thank you. We'll see, Gerald. Um, Peter? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I believe a lot of it can start with local government. Well, the federal uh, idea think tank or them starting the idea, uh, the program is important. Um, locally, we, we can make those changes. There's lots of examples across North America where individual municipalities or cities have made bans in place. And like Yip said, there's no, we don't really need plastic bags. There's lots of other good uh, uses or materials that can fulfill that need. Um, the other part is, you know, cardboard, there's good market for it, uh, especially in the communities that have available uh, all-season roads. Um, it's cheaper than landfilling by far by recycling cardboard. So it, it can be up to a, an individual community to create that ban in their waste stream. We don't always have to wait for territorial or federal uh, initiatives to get us going. And so I, I you know, would... Uh, support more local uh, localized um, results first. Merci, Peter. Um, this uh, brings us to a conclusion to this portion of our, our meeting. Um, I will uh, really express our gratitude to the three presenters and even for participating in the, our first ever panel discussion, uh, which was very, very informative. Uh, and we may look at a similar scenario moving forward. Um, and I want to thank you all again for taking the time out of your days to to, to joining us. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, members, uh, we'll wait around until everyone else is offline and then continue our wrap-up discussions. Um, I'll see you again. Thanks very much. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.